welcome everyone. Okay, uh, we've got a number of attendees, excellent, from um, different, uh, different um, from this institution, other institutions. I'd just like to introduce our, uh, pan uh, our panelists tonight. Uh, Jose, or Jose, uh, uh, Lina Nafafi, yeah? Okay. okay. All right, we had a run through with uh, uh, Jose's name, Jose's name before. Okay, and uh, Jose is a lecturer in Portug Portuguese and Lusophone studies and former program director of the MA in Black Humanities at the University of Bristol, which he joined in 2014. Now, uh, I'll ask jo Jose to say a few words about himself and some of the publications he's produced. But I know that there's a lot of um, concentration on um, West Africa and particularly Portuguese Africa and their involvement in Africa and, in a sense, the wider Atlantic world. OK, yeah. So in our session, we're going to focus. Well, actually, just say if you introduce yourself, then um, I'll just introduce the talk and start with the questions. OK, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Alan, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I, I think it is a great pleasure for me to be here, to be able to talk a little bit about my research and respond to some of the questions that perhaps the audience may want to ask me. Uh, as Alan just said, my name is uh, José Lingnan Afafe, uh, originally from Guinea-Bissau. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Birmingham and then after that I taught there for numbers of years. Then after that I went to Nottingham University. A year later, I've got the job here at the University of Bristol. My research focused very much on the West Coast of Africa. Initially, I looked at the question of the identity of the Portuguese traders who went to the West Coast of Africa um, uh, in the mid 15th century um, and their interaction with the African ruling class, African kings and so on, who sort of hosted them. Um, at that time. What interested me at that time was uh, when I started doing my PhD, which was very much to do with contemporary issues at that time, but then the war, civil war broke up in Guinea. And um, my supervisor advised me then, he said, you can't go to Guinea, you better go to, to uh, Lisbon and start doing archival work. So it was from there that the interest in finding out what the European did find in Africa. and. Uh, so as a result of that, I start looking at the merchant, um, you know, these free lines merchant who went to the West Coast of Africa from mid 15th century. But my other research, apart from the Portuguese identity on the West Coast of Africa, I'm now researching, um, you know, the discourse of um, abolition, slavery and abolition in the 17th century. Very many people talked about <coughs> slavery in the 18th, 19th century, if you like the beginning 18th, 19th century, um, ending in 19th century. But the research that I'm doing at the moment is challenging that assumption because we have a prince from Angola who went to the Vatican in 1684, uh, challenged the Vatican to abolish slavery, and it was a court case. Uh, that's what I'm researching at the moment and uh, looking at his connection with Brazil, Europe, and Africa. Uh, that book is going to be published by Cambridge University Press. So I think that roughly who I am in a nutshell. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, for this talk, we are going to have some interesting discussion about the identity of the, uh, the you know, the, the merchant so-called Lansardus. <laughs> okay, Jose, thank you so much. Um, I think that's it's, it's very interesting because just on the side like that, I remember talking with uh, Toby Green from who I know you know very well from King's College, and you know what emerged was that you know there's a rich source of records in Portu in Portugal about this kind of early um, kind of contact really between Europe and Africa, and in a sense um, the Portuguese in many ways, kind of blazed a trail there, I believe. You know, they really had a lot of strong trading links. And this is very interesting, even in the days before, you, you know, we, we have to, very much in Britain, we have this idea of this formal empire that developed in the 19th century. And really, it's, it's that period before, which is a really 
rich source of history and sort of very interesting perspectives coming out. Okay, so I think what Josie is going to focus on in this session is contact and trade between West Africa and Europe in the pre-colonial period. And he's going to focus on examining, uh, and you might help, help me with the pronunciation here, the Tangomas, who are also known as Lancados. Is that correct? Yeah, tango, yeah Tangomaos and Lanzados. Okay. And these are non-official Portuguese merchants, yeah? yeah? So they're, you know, sponsored by the state. They're like um, privateers in many ways, yeah? Yeah. So the port and this Portuguese mer mercantile settlers, commercial activities and cultural interactions on the west coast of Africa, which can also be regarded as a prelude to Creole societies and the development of those Creole societies in uh, particularly the western part of Africa. And then also we have Creole societies that have developed, uh, you know, on the other side of the Atlantic in, you know, we might even think of, say, Brazil, like, um, you know, um, you know, parts of uh, Louisiana, you know, we often romanticize New Orleans as being this place of mixed culture and, uh, you know, the bayous there, the, the kind of, um, you know, the, the water river systems that they have there. Okay, so um, what we're looking at is that initial contact. And in the lecture, Jose said that he will contrast their commercial activities with that of the official merchants. And so I've, I've raised a, a number of questions for Jose. How the, the session will run is I will ask Jose um, a series of um, seven or eight questions that we, we've talked about previously as being very useful to um, um, you know, d develop the idea, you know, showcase the ideas of just his research. And then what we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll put this out to the audience to ask questions and, you know, and you can type them in the the stream. Okay. Hopefully everyone's happy with that. If you are, you can give me a thumbs up or just say yes in the stream. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So the first question, Jose, is... Um, can you tell us something about the beginning of contact between the early, you know, the beginning of contact, the early Portuguese involvement in Africa? When did this begin? Who was involved? Um, you know, what, what was their agenda? What were, the, what were their reasons for, for going to uh, Western Africa there? Yes, that, that, is, that is a very good question, Alan. When I started the research, as I was saying, my big question was, why did the Portuguese went to West Coast, of, or why did they go to West Coast of Africa, and what did they find? Mm. Um, so that was what intrigued me, because, you know, the general history was, okay, they didn't find much. What they found, they were African running naked and all of this kind of stuff. I was thinking, mm. oh, it can't possibly be that. There must be other thing else going on. So when I started looking at the archives in Lisbon, and these archives were towards the Tombe, uh, mm. in Lisbon, uh, as well as uh, Archivo, the overseas archive called Archivo Historical Ultramarine in Belen, and also uh, some of the archive in, in the Palacio de Ajuda, which is the palace, the old palace, Portuguese mm. palace. There are a lot of documents there, many other documents in other, in other archives. But these were the three that are focused on. So I start looking at the early Portuguese contact with Africa. Early Portuguese contact with Africa started in 1415, uh, when they, you know, after removing what they so-called the enemy, the Berbers from the North African, uh, you know, um, it was from there then they went to Ceuta. They went to Ceuta um, in North Africa. From there, they started their conquest, but they failed. What then they have learned from, from that time was that the North African were trading with West Africa and, and that that trade was, was flourishing and that the, a lot of uh, goods were being traded internally uh, in Africa coming, coming from North Africa. Uh, possibly I would show you the map, uh, you know, the, the, the Catalan Atlas that then I went on to look at in Paris at that time, which showed that in the 14th century, 1375, you know, the, the Spanish were very much interested uh, on, on trade in Africa. 
but France in particular, because this particular atlas that was drawn in Catalan uh, was then sent to France because the King of France was interested in it. That is where it is now being housed in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So Portugal in North Africa, as I said, they have heard and learned a lot about what was happening in the interior of Africa or West Coast of Africa. So Portugal got to West Coast of Africa. The date sometimes is very disputed, but what we know that they landed on the West Coast of Africa, what is now called modern Guinea-Bissau in 1446, because one of their captain at that time, um, Nuno Tristão, was believed to have died in the region of Guinea-Bissau. So it was from that earlier contact that we know that you know from 1446, Portugal were already in contact with with West Coast of Africa, and then Cape Verde came later on. Uh, some would say, uh, you know, the the, the, the Portuguese came, went to Cape Verde in 1460. There again, the date is disputed. Um, but by 1483, by this time almost 30 years uh, on the west coast of Africa, Portugal landed in Congo. Um, Congo, El Salvador, uh, you know, what was called at that time. That Congo was part of what is, uh, you know, north part of uh, Angola then. So that early contact, the Portuguese crown was very much interested in this idea of trade. What we know at that time, that the, there were travelers as well coming from Germany, for example, there was a doctor uh, called Jerome Munza. Munza, who had contact with the royal family in, in the 15th, toward the end of 15th century, has written a manuscript, um, and that manuscript is now housed in Munich. We know from that manuscript that he talked a lot about the Portuguese contact with West Coast of Africa, in particular, uh, Don John II or King of Portugal. So the crown was interested on this idea of trade with, with, with Africa, but in particular West Africa. But knowing that they couldn't get via the northern part of Africa because of the Berber and so on, so they decided the maritime expedition would make it a lot, a lot easier for them to get into West Africa uh, via the sea. That is what Jerome Munza was telling us, that Portugal decided to go via sea because it was a lot easier for them to do that. So the people who were involved was the crown. This was an interest of the Portuguese crown. But at that time too, they knew that they were handicapped with the knowledge of the sea. So what they were doing, they employed merchant coming from Italy in particular. Uh, uh, Genoese were used at that time to carry out the trade for Portugal, but they were hired merchants. In particular, we know of um, uh, Alizio, or Alizio de Cadamosto, who went to the region of Guinea in 1455, went there twice, 1455 and 1456. He then wrote his own manuscript telling us about his own experience, his contact with Africa. The other merchant who also was employed by the Portuguese crown at that time, we also have document about him, was Antonio de Noli. Antonio de Noli became then, people say he was the one who, who found, was able to locate where Cape Verde was, some of the island. And then he was then appointed as a governor of Cape Verde for a number of years. So you have this thing, Portugal would say, well, it's not the Italian who found where Cape Verde was. Uh, it was us, but you know, the Italian who said, no, we were there first and so on. So this were the group. You, you, you have the official group, the group that were hired by the crown for a particular mission to go to Africa. And they also have their percentage, how they were paid. They were laded or, or loaded with boat or so-called caravel at that time. And the crown would pay them one third, uh, if you like, uh, of the of whatever good they may have been able to, to capture from West Coast of Africa. The rest then would stay for the crown. So these were the official side, but they weren't staying on the West Coast of Africa for many years. Some of them were there for two months or three months, five months and returned it because they needed to give their report back to the crown. 
And then we have the second group that was very much involved, which is the group that I have researched in the book that I published here. I, I, I hope you can see the, 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 the color of it, the very bright yellow published by Peter Lang in 2007. Um, it is called The Colonial Encounters, Issues of Culture, Hybridity and Creolization, Portuguese Merchant uh, Settlers in West Africa. So that was a book that emerged from this. Um, so you have the official side and then you have the free line merchant, you know, those who were not being employed by the crown because of the news that was returning back that Africa had these trading um, goods, that, you know, everybody wanted to go. So these merchants went under their own initiative to West Coast of Africa. And they are the ones that are very much focused here. So the, the, the second part of your question, Alan, um, I think you ask, you know, what was their agenda? Is that is that what it is? Can you hear me? Yeah, that's, yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. What was what was their agenda? Apart from you know this early contact, the Portuguese what they did officially, they contacted African ruling class. They get in contact with African kings in the region where they went. Kadamosa in particular was very much eager to do that on the coast. He would say, here, here, we brought presents for your king, meaning taxes for your king to allow us to, to trade. So the people who were, were involved were the merchant and the free merchant, the official side and non-official side. What was the agenda? The agenda here, you read the history of Portugal by many historians, and they would tell you that it was to do with the spreading of the faith. But actually, that is not what it is. What we know from the historian of the, the, um, the, uh, or, or the chronicler of the Portuguese crown, uh, Gomes Yanis de Zurara, what is written at that time, he has said that there were five reasons why Portugal needed to go overseas. And those five reasons were, the first one was that they wanted to know the region beyond the Canaries Island and beyond the Cabo Jador, which was the Moroccan side. And he also said, secondly, they wanted to know, uh, uh, you know what kind of goods were being traded at that time from that side of the, you know, the world. And the third motive, he said, not only knowing about the goods, that would be brought back to Portugal. We wanted also to know the power of the enemy, how powerful the enemy on the other side is. And then the fourth one, he said, we needed to create an ally with, with the people there that would help us to have conquered the world you know, or, or, or to have this war of 31 years or beyond. But what we know historically, was that there was this belief that there was a king, an African king called Preston John. Preston John was believed to be a Christian who was fighting his enemy with the symbol of the cross. So Portugal, who were getting fed up with Muslim fighting, and they thought if they could find this, this, this king, African king fighting in the name of Christianity, it would help them to conquer the Muslim. And then, the, you know, the final thing, the fifth motif uh, was here that they then would bring in the Christian faith to that region. So Christianity came as a last motif. The first motif was trade, 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 and then finding out about the power of the enemy and to be able to find an ally and then bringing in faith um, to those people. Okay, that is really... Thank you so much for that answer. That's very interesting. And the way in which the, you know, um, what you're saying there about Prester John and the, the way that, that, in a sense, that myth, that myth has uh, been perpetuated really well into the 19th and early 20th century. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, even uh, John Buchan, who wrote many of these imperialist novels, kind of... Uh, uh, I think he, he did a book about Prester John. Anyway, so we've learned a lot there about the, the, the trading and the motivation. And also, I, I think there's, there's that idea of the sailing techniques developing as well, which made it possible to go into the Atlantic, you know, into the prevailing winds, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, good. All right. So when we're, I, I think you've, you've touched on a lot of the geography. We're looking at parts of the western coast of Africa. I, I just will ask you to say one thing about that. Why were some of those areas so, uh, you know, the, the, the Cape Verde, Guinea, what is now Guinea-Bissau, and uh, what eventually became uh, what is now Angola? Why, why those areas? Why did they become so? Uh, in a sense, attractive to the Portuguese, or you know, maybe this is later, the, a later period. Uh, you know, what was it about those areas that they were were finding so um, attractive? I think I think what the Portuguese found attractive at that time was, you know, the trade goods mm. that were coming from from this region, in particular ivory, um, and and. Um, many other things like the local produce but also you know the idea that africa had you know found a completely different at mm. that time from 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 western europe so animals and other things that they could trade um initially it was that trade that you know trading good not 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 in human uh in slave as we come to know later on that came later but the immediate reaction was that they could trade in, in gold, they could trade in other things, which they found. They found gold in Elmina, uh, what is now modern Ghana, uh, and so on. But in the region of West Coast of Africa, they attempted to, to, to seek that trade, thinking that they could find. And what the most information they were getting was very much that they wanted to go to the region of Mali, Tumbuktu, and so on. But it was very difficult to do that, you know. To get into it, to, to get into that area, mm. so the region of Guinea, um, they started, or the region of Senegal, what is now Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry, and Sierra Leone, they they started trade there, and then later on, they 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 established themselves in Cape Verde, and mm. from there, and they, then they start trading, um, you know, capturing the enslaved and so on, brought the Cape Verde to sort of settle. As a result of that, we come back to that later on. And then the idea was that they wanted to also go to India. The idea of traveling to India on the coast to India have forced them to look south. Mm. For that, they established themselves in Santome. In Santome, they established themselves in 1471. Almost uh, 20 years later on, they established themselves in the Congo. Uh, in the Congo region, which is in was in 1483, and then later on Angola. Okay. It was very much to do with that trade. You know, and the Angolan tradition would have it that, you know, when the Portuguese arrived there, they they traded with the good. They buy chicken eggs and and they bought other goods. Later on, they exchange with their good, and then second time, third time, they start doing that. They brought them fire. They were spitting fire on them, which meant that they start fighting wars you know, against them. So there was that interest of finding, you know, India. As a result of that, you know, they, you know, they found other region of West Coast of Africa. That time. Yeah. So gradually creeping down. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's so interesting. So um, I'm sure that some of our attendees will be asking you questions about that. You know, maybe we can also discuss the, in, in, you know, the, the um, contact with what is now Mozambique, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on, I'd really like to talk to you or you to speak about the interactions. Though, what what were the characteristics of the trading relationship between African societies and the Portuguese traders? Because I think you know we're as you touched on it before. The you know the the, the subject of slavery clouds a lot. You know we, we tend and. You know, say Walter Rodney's book. You know the, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Yeah, in a sense, as the kind of the, maybe a certain negativity. But I think in this early day, we're really seeing a kind of equality here in the in the relationship. But yeah. I'll, I'll allow you to speak about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, Rodney Rodney PhD one of his other book, which is called the History of Upper Guinea Coast. Also, he he, he talked a little bit about the merchant uh, there and very much their children, you know, the children after their marriage to African women, what kind of society they form. But possibly we come back to that. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, the, yeah, the nature of that trade to begin with, it was a peaceful trade. Of course, there, you know, there, there were other fields, pocket of violence there and here and so on. Say, for example, in the Congo, when Diogo Kang arrived in the Congo in 1483, what, uh, what happened as they were trying to find where the, the king of Congo was, they lost each other. They lost each other, they panicked. They thought that the African have captured them, uh, one of their colleagues. So what they then they did, they retaliated, captured some African, they brought them back to Portugal. They stayed for almost two years. They taught them Portuguese. They then were taken back to the Congo, um, you know, as as a as interpreter. Yeah. They found when they got to the uh, king's palace in Congo, they found you know their colleague that they were lost. You know that they were there safe and sound. That relationship that was established then was a very peaceful relationship. So that was the kind of relationship that was established uh, in the fairly face of um, you know the Portuguese trade with the African. African rulers were receptive of them. Some of them accepted Christianity. They exchanged their name or they changed their names to giving them you know African, you know European names and so on. Um, you then have from that early period, you have a lot of exchange ambassadorially, African ambassadors to Portugal, um, and vice versa. The kings of Portugal, you, you, you find a lot of letters being written, what ambassadors were taking back to West Coast of Africa. Some of the items included hat, including, uh, you know, the big, the big, the big uh, overhead, uh, over, you know, the, the, the coats that you wonder sometimes this code must have been very heavy for the climate of Africa. But, you know, there was a lot of exchange from this period and so on. Uh, David, uh, Basil Davidson talked a lot about this period, that there was very much what you may call this happy relationship that went on initially with Portugal and West Coast of Africa. Later on, that relationship went sour, we know that, uh, and, and so on. But in this early phase, the characteristic of that relationship was very much trade in friendship, using mm-hmm. Basil Davidson, uh, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I just want to say at that point, you know, for many of the listeners, if a few people out there don't know, but Basil Davidson, bless that man, what a, a friend of African history he was, you know, a very early champion, Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, good. Uh, just moving on then, um, we've had a few comments in the stream about, which I'll come back to, but someone saying a fascinating talk, Jose. Oh, which thank is, you. <laughs> okay, so my next question, I'm going to take, Jose, to t- tell us about the Tangomas, or known as Lancados. Uh, you can do the pronunciation for me. Yeah. When did uh, I'm quite interested in when this distinct um, Afro-European merchant class began to emerge and what were the characteristics of their identity. Um, I studied El Mina in the Gold Coast right. for a little bit and we're, we're finding the same thing there with maybe the the, 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 the Danish, the Dutch, the English traders that went there and, and uh, people involved. But uh, this Portuguese area, you know, slightly earlier. Could you tell us something about this society and when these people, you know, when this begins to really begin to emerge and what are its yeah. characteristics? Okay. I think what we don't have, because the the, the Lanzados, the Tangamaus did not, we I haven't found anything specifically written by them. In other words, written by themselves. Mm. The document we found or are found in the archive are written by the people who were trying to demonstrate that they weren't of a very good character because okay. of their trading uh, you know, with other Europeans. The reason they were treated so bad or they had a bad press from the Portuguese side, or from the Portuguese loyal, was that Portugal by 16th century already established that they should only have the monopoly of trading with the African alone. Other Europeans who were coming to the region that we already made contact with were seen as foreigners. 
So foreigners in the 16th century meant European, like the French or the Brits uh, and so on, or the, uh, the Spaniard or others and so on. So the characteristic of these merchants, they were freelance merchants. They left Portugal, they didn't tell the crown what they were going to do because then they would have been committed to having contract signed, having to report back to Portugal. Very often people say they were rejected group, rejected group in a sense coming from the word land side, which means in Portuguese thrown out. People say they were criminal, criminal including, including religious heretics, people who were not in accordance with the principle of Christianity were then seen as, you know, um, these seeds grow in a society that weren't very good. So some of them, they said, were casted out. But the group was much more complex than that. The group here included well-to-do Portuguese, whom we describe as the Lansards and Tangamaus. Rodney himself had said that they were the European traders, the European traders who went completely native, quoting him who have adopted African culture, religion, and used African tattoos. Uh, Boxer, uh, the British historian, also have described them as those who went completely native, uh, went completely African from this point of view. But their characteristics, they were very much of a mixed group. They mm. were not the, renega uh, the renegated as we have the term in Brazil. Not only that, among them were also the new Christian, the Jews converted to Christianity, who then felt that they couldn't stay because of the pressure in Portugal. They left Portugal, and some of them were not converted to Christianity. They left Portugal, ended up on the west coast of Africa. And these were the, the merchant group that were being uh, given hospitality by the local king. The local king also protected them because they knew of their plight. What I've been trying to argue in the book is that the West Coast of Africa this time was very tolerant to the newcomers, regardless of people, race, culture, religious status or whatever. People were being given accommodation. In other words, they were being allowed to stay in the region provided that they follow what you may call the law of the land. Because what we know at that time too, that certain Portuguese who were loyal to Portuguese crown were following this merchant to the west coast of Africa. And the document I have stated in the book was that it was the local rulers, local king who were saying to this Portuguese loyal, here religion doesn't really matter. It matter in a sense, but we do not persecute people because of their particular faith. Everybody here is free to practice religion that they want, provided that they follow the rule of the land. That yeah. was what it was. And for that, you know, these merchants were being protected by the local rulers. Mm. They were their guests. So their characteristic was very much these amalgamas of different status mm. coming from Portugal at that time. It's almost like being incorporated into the society. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, all right, um, moving that on, because that's a really important point you made. Um, just to the attendees, please ask questions in the stream, and then what I'll do at the end, I will pick up some of these questions. If you want Jose to say, Jose to say any more about some of those uh, topics he's um, been covering. Okay, um, so when we're looking at the uh, the these... Um, in a sense, you're saying really that because some of the these men began to marry into African families, taking African wives and so on, that what you you begin to get is this kind of emergence of, a, 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 in a sense, like a Euro-African society. People yeah. might identify slightly more with Europe than Africa. Yeah, you know, this is one of these things that people begin to use, you know, like Anglo-Indian, Euro-African, yeah, yeah, yeah. being part African. Um, um, they were restricted to commerce and trade, or did they become involved in other fields, such as the military or administration? How did this role develop over the next few centuries from this 15th, 16th century period? 
Yeah, that that I think that I think is 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 a very good question, Alan. Uh, as I said, this group, if they were uh, accepted within the African society, uh, as you just mentioned, they married into the African families, and uh, some of them marry into the African, uh, you know, uh, royal family. Mm. It wasn't just marrying the ordinary African because they were being hosted by Africans. So this is what we found in Angola and in particular in Congo. So they were not just simply trading. They were trading, they were doing commerce, but some of them too were involved, if you like, in the military. In Congo, we found, uh, I have documented in the new book that I'm writing now, that there you found Portuguese who were given residence by the kings of Congo. There then now, alongside Congo fighting against Portugal if there was war that was going on. So this group was very much a malleable group, if I could use that term, a group that was very fluid. They were also used as ambassadors in those early days. In Congo in particular, the first Congolese, the first ambassador that was sent to Congo uh, to, uh, in the 15th century was a Portuguese man who was a resident in Congo. It was later on in the 6th, 17th century, 16, um, 1605, that we found Antonio Negrita, who left Congo and up in Brazil, Brazil, Portugal, Portugal, Spain, Spain, to Ivone, Ivone to Madrid. Um, he died in the Vatican. I can show his image later on. He's passed in, in, in Rome. Um, uh, so, you know, the picture I took about, about this ambassador called Antonio Nemfunda. So what you find in this group, they were part of the service, military service. They were also used as counterintelligence. These were the people who were also feeding the local king what was the Portuguese intention. Even through the, to, to the 17th century, when the crown, the two crown, you know, you know uh, Portuguese crown and the Spanish crown joined together. I found a letter. Madrid was really hostile to this group because they were complaining to the Vatican that this group were feeding in information to Africa, which they shouldn't. And they also complained that, you know, even the new Christian among those groups who were in Africa, some of them were in the Vatican feeding, you know, the information and so on. But what I found from, from in this book, that they were also involved as educators in Africa, music in particular, in Sierra Leone alone, I have found a well-to-do Portuguese who married nine African women. And, and he, he, he was a musician, but he was of a, a high, high status in Portugal. What he told the missionary when, when they found out that he was there, he told them who he was, but he didn't want them to take the news back to Portugal. We also found that this particular, particular group, the Lansardos and Tangamas, were also involved on the question of religiosity of African. They were practicing African religion. Among the Temnes of Sierra Leone, I have found a document that in that shrine, who was the high priest here, was one of the Lansardos and Tangamas person. It, it show you the integration. I have argued in the book that they, these people were Africanized. They're very much into the African society. Among them, too, you find lawyers who were serving alongside the African. In Congo, in particular, you know, the Portuguese also complained that the new Christian who were there in the Congo were serving as a lawyer, defending the interests of Congo and all of that. That so interesting that kind of the way that that relationship is very interesting the way that relationship between the tangomos and the portuguese is changing and i guess as well through generations you know the first generation you know with more maybe they're, they're, they're kind of more european traits and then later having to keep keep hold of those traits to, to, to in a sense define themselves as a group yeah. Okay, next question to you, Jose, is, and this is what you find in other parts of Africa as well, you know, when you get this distinct group growing, uh, coming together, is 
in a sense, is about resilience. Did these Creole societies survive uh, during the period of formal Portuguese empire in West Africa in the 19th century? You know, did they, in a sense, could they have a role or were they just pushed aside? Yeah. Could you um, yeah. speak about that maybe? Yes, I think I think this is a very good, a very good question, Alan. Because the more you think about it, you think what have survived, and they, of course they did survive. Uh, today we talk about Cape Verde as a nation, hmm. but Gihad Saiba would argue that Cape Verde was a Creole society, and it is a Creole society because in Cape Verde Islands, um, there during the you know. 15th century, the settlement started. The African who were brought in uh, were brought in and marrying the European who were there. But also, what you find in the region of mainland Africa, in the region of Guinea, you know, the Lansardis group were also, as, as we've been saying, were also marrying. So there has been, you know, people have survived, and apart from the nation that you were saying, okay, that nation came there was very much wide. Mix. It wasn't just the people who escaped from Portugal. Uh, you know, these were very much the official Portuguese who were in Cape Verde and so on. But that Creole society was there. In the region of Guinea, you have until today, when I started doing my other research on the British settlers in Guinea Bissau in the 18th century, 1792, on this island called Bulama, um, which then, you know, the British at that time, what they were thinking about was the creation of the Creole society, because the idea was to go abolish slavery in Africa and then create a society which was a mixed society, African and European marrying each other. So my colleague at that time, when I was starting this research, what she told me, she said, look, my real name, she said, is Levy, Levy. And she said, I'm a descendant of the Jews, the Jews who came, who were in the region of, um, northern part of Guinea-Bissau. So, the, so there, you are, there, there, there are survival from, from that particular group, but we also have a much wider group that survived in Guinea, as well as in Santome, Principe, as well as in, in Angola and Congo. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, the, again, the, you know, in the sense like the resilience of those societies, in the sense, as you, you, you've said about Guinea-Bissau, how that is in effect your, and we'll, we'll come on along a little bit later to that definition of what we might mean by a Creole society. Just for, okay. the, people, just for the attendees, I'm going to ask one more question and I'm going to throw it out to the audience. Right, okay. Questions, but I want you to ask questions, um, not just, um, you know, coming from the chair. Just even, even if you've got comments, you, you want... Uh, Jose, to give you further explanation, um, he's more than happy to do that. I can see by his his, um, his expression, he's enjoying himself. <laughs> okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank well, you. Good. Okay. Uh, just in, in a sense, this is my own curiosity. You know, we, we often, when we started our African Studies Centre, the, the idea was we would like focus initially in this first term on. Um, uh, medieval Africa, but I've, I've, I've got to ask you a question about, you know, colonial, I've done that, and then post-colonial society. So, yeah. post-colonial society, you know, in our ex-Portuguese colonies, you know, um, uh, is there like a distinct Creole identity? Does that society still exist? Um in the ex-Portuguese West Africa. I've been reading David Burnham's book there. Right. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I thought we got an answer to it already, but I would like you to maybe speak to the audience. He's talking there about Angola. Could you could you tell us, um, what, you know, where, where you see the main centres of that that, that uh, population, as it were? I think, I think the population is there, but it's very much you know, has been consumed gradually back into the general population. Uh, in Guinea-Bissau, for example, you may have people who would claim themselves to come from the island of Bulama. Bulama was very much a mixed society in the 18th century, 19th, well, 19th century in particular. So people claim I'm from Bulama, they're meaning my distinctive identity is very much a dual identity. That duality go back to European and vice versa, and and so on. And this is also what you find in Cape Verde. 
that were in the post-colonial identity or colonial identity um, during the, 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 the Portuguese colonial domination in, in Africa, in particular, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, and Angola, the people that they favored at that time to take over the administrative work and be the civil servant were very much these people with dual heritage because they saw them as people who were very much connected to them. Mm -hmm. Also people who from the early days, because of their dual heritage, had much more privilege to get into education. So because of that, they were highly educated and it was easy for them to get into these positions and so on. Um, in the case of Guinea-Bissau, you have our first president of independence who was Luis Cabral. He was of that kind of Creole society that you could say. Uh, but a lot of people, because of certain political um, rhetoric, they sometimes don't want to distinguish themselves as a, they are distinctively Creole as such. But other people tended to see them as, uh, you know, that they are. But very often they don't want to be seen in that way. So for that reason, very often you don't get it. Obviously, people declaring themselves to be of Creole society. But the general public know that they are. And so on. In some cases, you get people who declare themselves that they belong to. Yeah. I mean, it's going back a few years, like 50 to be precise. But, you know, the two very famous footballers who played for um, Portugal, Coluna and Sabio, were both of mixed heritage. They were from Mozambique, I believe. Yeah. 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 Coluna became the minister of uh, sport in, uh, in Mozambique. But they both had this mix of European and African heritage. Yeah. So these are really interesting. Now, we have some completely fascinating talk we have some questions in the stream and i want other people to ask right I've got, uh, from hannah cosworth uh she's one of our attendees today she said thanks so much for this talk i'm finding it fascinating what it, and her question is what enabled the portuguese to have ships that were able to travel in the atlantic or were their ships not particularly complex technologically advanced is it maybe Question we could develop it. Is it the ships or is it the sailing techniques? Would you like to um, maybe comment on that for us, Jose? Josie? Yeah, okay. What, uh, what we know from the early days was that there was a sailing technique or developing the skill of, uh, uh, you know, of boat making in Spain. And Portugal then, by the 15th century, they created a school, what you may call naval school of making boats, and it was run by the, uh, you know, by the uh, by the by the royal family in Sagres, in particular in Portugal. So they were learning that technique, but the technique is much more, what you could say it wasn't only just European. This was a technique that was coming from the Arabs, you know, the Bussola, as we know it, you know, the, the navigation guide and so on, was not European. This was coming from the Arabs at that time. So the knowledge that, you know, the, 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 the Italian who were in contact in, in their trade, Genesis in particular, with Persian and so on, and the Asian region, we're bringing back some knowledge that time back to Europe. And this is why you find at this time, Portuguese employed very much what we now call the Italian, but Genoese to sort of help them with the, you know, with the knowledge of going overseas and so on. The boats they were using at that time were quite small, you know, mm. the caravan. And, and yeah. this is why people would say when they went to, to east coast of Africa, uh, in Mozambique in particular, the Mozambican or the African, they ridiculed them, saying this boat can't take you to India. You better leave them here. We are going to take you in our own boats because their boat was much more efficient, you know, powerful and so on. Yeah. But the history tend not to tell us that. It mm. was very much like the Portuguese discovery. But who took the, you know, the, the Portuguese to India were the African who were already trading 
thousands of years prior to the Portuguese arrival. So going back to answering that question, it was accumulation of knowledge from different part of the world that aided that knowledge of boat making. Mm. But also, if we talk about other things which I possibly didn't mention, when we talk about the European expansion to the west coast of Africa, we tended to see it because that is how history tended to sort of uh, nationalize these events. At least it was European, uh, it was Portuguese expansion. It was Portuguese project, a national project. No, it wasn't like that. The people who funded a lot of this expedition were the Italian merchant, the Genoese, who invested their own money, helping Portuguese to be able to, for example, Portuguese, uh, you know, the expedition from there to, to India and so on, as I was saying, that expedition was paid by some of the Italian merchants. So technology was very much a technology being adopted from elsewhere. Mm. But then they developed the skill of building, you know, their own their own boats and so on. Okay, I, hope yeah. that, I hope that I've answered the question. No, you have. I mean, you made a very fascinating point because one of my colleagues here at work, whose um, family was originally from Goa, he was born in Mozambique and then grew grew up in his later years in uh, uh, in uh, Portugal. You know, went into the Portuguese army in the the mid like the late seventies, I believe. You know, did national service. Right. You know, the journey of his family is like really fascinating. You know, he's come from here to here and so on. And you know that the that's the other side of Africa we're talking about. But you know, it's it's a fascinating topic that that crisscrossing between those oceans, between yeah. the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. Yeah incredible isn't it really and even then the portuguese went down to macau in you know um, china yeah? yeah you know the china seas all right so um a question from natasha bowen and she's asking a question about how trade was affected when the portuguese took africans uh to portugal you know when these africans began to be taken into Portugal, maybe as curiosities, people they could educate, you know, show off and so on like this. Um, how, how was trade affected? And I think I would add something to Hannah, you know, it's maybe also a supplementary question. Is, is when, do you, when would you locate the period when the, the, the view of the Europeans, of the Africans began to change from that, from that mutual, uh, if not dependency, then, then, that, then you know, that, that relationship of cooperation to one we get of domination. But the first part, it, the Africans going to Portugal, how did this change things uh, for, the, um, for the trade that was going on between the two, between Africa and Portugal? Okay. Yeah, I think I think I think it is it is a very good question because as I was saying, from mid fifteen toward the end of fifteenth century, there were already diplomatic relationship between Portugal and, and the African. What the Portuguese Crown did, I've got a document which is new research, not a new book, or not on this book, on the book that I'm writing for Cambridge, is that what they established at that time was that African rulers, African kings, who were their allies, should marry within the African, within within the, the royal family, if there were need to do that. If there wasn't anybody to marry, then the noble person could marry this, you know, from within the African and so on. I have found one of the king of kings of Guinea. Uh, who left and went to Cape Verde in the, in the 16th century, saying that his daughter is now ready for marriage and that the marriage must be consummated because according to the rule, he's waiting for the Portuguese to send, you know, uh, delegation to make that marriage possible. African going to Portugal at that time was a big thing. It was a big thing. It was a curiosity, but also it was that they were creating this bond of diplomatic relations. That was the idea. Uh, we found in, in 1493, a prince from the region of Senegal, Jolof Kindo, called Bimoy, he went to Portugal. 
I, I, I talk quite a lot about, about him here. He stayed there. The Portuguese wanted to convert him to Christianity. But that was the struggle. The struggle was him converting to Christianity, going back to his kingdom. It wasn't going to be that easy. He stayed for a while in Portugal and then accepted Christianity, nominally one could say, um, and then presented during his ceremony for that uh, acceptance of Christianity, there was a huge feast done by the, by the Portuguese crown. And then Bemoy presented a speech about his experience in Africa. Not only that, they also, because he went with a lot of people, they demonstrated their skill in using horses. The Portuguese report at that time, we have never seen anything like it. African jumping from the horse back, picking stones from the, from, the, from, from the ground and jumping back to the horse and all of these other skills and so on. And then be more presentation, they said, he spoke like a prince from Athens, mm. but he was black. So it was, you know, there was that amusement. You also find from the Congo, they're sending their children to study in Portugal. Afonso I was sending his own cousin. How he was he paying them their fee in Portugal? He was paying it with ivory. And then he said, those who couldn't do it, who couldn't take their, their degree, they should then be, rather than returning back to Congo, they empty-handed, they should be sent to monastery, at least to study, to, you know, to do religious studies. So there was that optimism mm. about African relations and so on. But all of that changed because of the need when, you know, Santome and Cape Verde, you know, the introduction of sugar production and so on, so it was from that time things beginning to change. The need for the enslaved African was beginning to be part of it. And the Spanish going to Hispaniola by the end of uh, 15th century, then staying there, there was a need because you know, the native Amerindian or the native Americans were not able, not that they were not able, my argument would be they were simply running away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for that slavery to be effective, it has to be geographically distanced. To enslave people in their own territory is not that easy. You enslave people who are coming from different regions, by the time they get to know the terrain, then you may have made your own profit or whatever. So attempt to answer that question, that relationship was good initially, but gradually it, 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 it changed. It changed because of the, you know, the trade emphasis wasn't just simply on the Jews, but this time it was very much on the enslaved African because of, you know, sugar plantation in Santa Tome, but also the idea, I don't like to use the term discovery, that's why I haven't used it at all. Just, <laughs> um, when, when, yeah, when the people got to Brazil, hmm. um, it was by, you know, 15, 16, 15, 20, almost 30 years later on that they started discovering the soil in Brazil was far much better for sugar production. Yeah. And that presented the need for a new form of trade with Africa. Yeah. That was very much by this time they were beginning to wage war on Africa. I wouldn't call it trade. I would yeah. say, you know, slavery was war being waged on Africa, in particularly Africa. They, yeah. you know, going back to the question, they used their African ally at that time because that ally was formed for a long period of time. Yeah. Then that is how that relationship started. I mean, this is one of the things that, you know, in the two previous talks by Bernadette Rossi, uh, Bernadette Rossi and Toby Green, we've kind of begun to really think about in these uh, sessions um is that idea of uh the you know cash crops being developed in other places that lead to this like intensification of warfare and the need to you know um transport populations really because in in underpopulated areas to do this quite labor intensive work 
you know, and the, 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 you know, the complexity of the dynamics between the, the trade, uh, the, the development of uh, cash crops, the European need or desire for sugar, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of like is one the substance of the age that le le leads to a whole sort of set of dynamics. Um, thank you so much, Joseph. I, we could listen to this for a, so I'm going to say that I'm going to email you afterwards and invite you back at some <laughs> time and keep that link going because you've been a, a fantastic speaker. Uh, we've got lots of positive comments from people, how much they're enjoying what you're talking about, the clarity, the logical sequencing of things and can really sort of follow complex debates with, you know, your wonderful kind of, teaching skills so thank you and you know your deep research okay um i did look on amazon for your book but it says f five stars and it's you know they don't have any copies but <laughs> as as I can, i'm gonna secure a copy of that book because it's you know what you've said if that's the content then that's completely fascinating so um thank you very much once again and thank you for supporting our initiative just for all our listeners just for all the attendees there'll be another talk on the 11th of um uh, uh, uh january um with richard reed from oxford talking about um warfare and development in africa i think his focus is there going to be on the 19th and early 20th century but that's fine that's also a period that i'm fascinated by and interested in and i'm sure uh, you know other list you know the attendees here so thank you so much and thanks everyone for supporting the new vic african studies center it's a new initiative trying to sort of spread the word and get people interested in our um in you know this fascinating subject and you can see from today the complexity of it all so thank you very much for coming in jose thank and you thank you everyone else for uh you know being part of this so bye-bye okay bye-bye thank you bye-bye thank you bye-bye bye-bye